if you remember, like Bob Clark and Doug Campbell, they actually devoted a show. What was it called? The Lies of Fletcher yeah, Pratt. The Lies of Fletcher Pratt. What right. a joke. Yeah. What an embarrassment. I mean, those. <laughs> Just like Shepherd of Fire says, it's me, it's me, it's the Triple B. Big Bad Bob here with you for episode number 244. 244. That's right. This is the Lone Gunman Podcast, and I am Rob Clark, aka the Triple B, Big Bad Bob. I got a banger of a show for for you today. Uh basically like a little potpourri type show and uh just a little bit of everything that we've been talking about here the past couple weeks a lot of new uh, documents i've stumbled across to share with you and uh, some new insights into some things so stay tuned for all that but before we get into the show let's hear a word from our delicious sponsor that's right folks you love them and you know them it's silk city hot sauce baby Big Bad Bob here with you for Silk City Hot Sauces. Why Silk City? Because this hot sauce comes to you directly from Patterson, New Jersey, also known as Silk City. These hot sauces are 100% natural, gluten-free, vegan, contain no chemicals, fillers, dyes, or junk. Everything is packed into recyclable glass containers because glass doesn't leach weird flavors into the product. All other hot sauces are sourced in small batches from locally bought fresh peppers. It's all about the pepper people. I'm telling you, your boy, Big Bad Bob, loves his food like he loves his women. Hot and spicy, but not so hot you can't eat them. <laughs> so, if you love yourself some sauce and you're tired of trying to transform your bland meat into something edible with the tip of a jar you will transform your life forever head over to silkcityhotsauce.com place an order and upon checkout enter the code GUNMAN that's G-U-N-M-A-N for 20% off of your entire order you won't regret it thank me later peace That's right, folks. And I believe their summer sale is still going on where you can get 13 bottles of hot sauce for 65 bucks. You cannot beat this deal anywhere. So while supplies last, head over to SilkCityHotSauce.com, enter your order, put in the code GUMMAN at checkout, and receive 20% off your order. And support this show. If you love me, you'll do it. Get some hot sauce. It's good. For your innards. It helps clean you out. Clean the pipes. Nothing like having clean pipes, folks. Ain't nothing wrong with that. And before we get into things here, I just want to formally make the announcement here on the Lone Gummin Podcast that your boy, Big Bad Bob, and his faithful sidekick, <laughs> listener of the show, uh, and brilliant mind of his own, uh, Joe Borelli, will be presenting together at Lancer this year. Okay. 
Uh, we're going to be doing it virtually, which means we're not going to be there, unfortunately. But we have been working for months and months and months and months on putting together a hell of a show. It's going to be a probably four hour extravaganza on the Lone Gummit podcast channel here audibly and also on YouTube with an accompanying video so you can see everything that we're talking about. You can see our beautiful faces and it's going to be amazing. But we also agreed to do Lancer this year and we are going to uh, make a composite um, presentation. It's only going to be an hour long. Um, but Lancer will have it exclusively before it is released on the Loon Gummin podcast channels. Um, so if you want to see some great new and exciting research instead of the same old fluffy duffy crap that's been regurgitated over the years, all right, make sure you either get your ass to Dallas. And and attend the Lancer conference in person. And uh, for everybody that doesn't know, Doug Campbell is going to be in Dallas this year. So make sure you look for the long-haired guy wearing the black leather jacket and Chuck Taylors. <laughs> and uh, if you can't attend Dallas this year, make sure you at least head over to the website and sign up for the virtual conference. That means you can stream all the speakers. You can stream our presentation. And you'll get an early look at this uh, groundbreaking new research into the Kennedy assassination that we've been working on here for the past many, many months. Well, probably a year now. Um, you will see exactly where and how far uh, just a little bit of collaborative, out of the box, new thinking research can get you. Just when you think that everything in the Kennedy assassination has been beaten like a dead horse and regurgitated like the girl from the exorcist. Uh, we are proud to bring you some new information. So make sure you are either attending or checking it out. Okay. There's my hard sell. So today on the show, we're going to be talking about, like I said, all kinds of stuff. I'm going to be jumping jumping around like a like a little jumping spider trying to make his way across the pond on the lily, lily pads. Lily pads. That's almost a word I can't say. Uh it must be something to do with the L's. Uh much like Liberty Lob Liberty Lobby. Liberty Lobby. Yes, there I said it. Um but I digress. So let's get right into it. First document. A document. Oh, and just real quick, for all you folks listening out there, here is just a window, a small window, into the background of how I put this show together. A lot of, I hear from a lot of people, whether it be through YouTube comments, whether it be through emails or, or direct messages or on Twitter, whatever the case may be, it appears, you know, I have talked about something weeks ago. And then somebody will finally listen to the show and say, excuse me, and say, hey, Rob, I heard on the show X, Y, and Z. Hey, could you please point me towards that document? <laughs> well, I am sorry to say that I don't really work like that. Here, here's how it goes. I do research. I comb through documents. I read books. Okay? I don't just come in here willy-nilly pulling some shit off Wikipedia. You know what I'm saying? I, I don't just watch a YouTube video and then come in here and talk about it. Although, I have done a couple shows like that. Um, but most of the time, what you hear on this show comes from things that I've ran across in the course of my research into the Kennedy assassination. Now, this is not 1966, folks, where I have 
you know, 20 file cabinets full of Xerox documents that I have painstakingly put into alphabetical order into folders based upon certain criteria. No, no, no. That's not how your boy works. So as I'm combing through things and I find something that jumps off the page of me and I might want to talk about on the show, I will print that page off. And I will call certain documents into piles uh, based on, you know, uh, one central theme, if you will. Sometimes, like today, um, I have come across some things where there's just not enough meat on the bone to do a show about. Or it's something that I've already done a show about, and I find something new that I can add to that uh, to that uh, show that I did before with other information pertaining to something else that we've already talked about here. So I print off the document, I get them together, and like you were here today, we're going to go through a lot of documents. And when I'm done going through these documents, they go in right here. Right here into this metal trash can. Yeah, I should recycle, but you know, I don't. Um, sue me. But I read the documents and they go in the trash can. I don't have 20 million windows opened up on my computer. I don't have 20,000 files saved on my computer. All that just junks everything up and it's something that you really don't need, something you'll never have to go back through. So I don't even bother. So I print off stuff. I talk about it here and it goes in file 13. So when you ask me to point you towards a document that I read here, I can't do it. I can't. I, I apologize, but I'm sorry. I, I just can't do it because I don't know. What, I, half the time, I don't know where I got it from. Um, You know, there's so many research archives out there whether it be NARA, the Weisberg Archives, uh, you know, uh, John Armstrong, the Baylor, um, you know, the Dallas Municipal Files, uh, the Key Persons Index. I mean, there, there's so many resources out there to, to research and look for documents and comb through. Um, that It's just hard to remember where you got something. So... I apologize in advance, but that's just how I roll. And, you know, I'm not here to do everybody else's work for them. Okay. You know, if you're interested in this assassination, I'm giving you something that I found. And you are more than capable of using what I gave you and building upon it or trying to search for the same thing. These aren't hidden somewhere in some dusty corner of the dark web, folks. You know, they are publicly available documents. You just have to do a little digging. Whether that be through Mary Farrell, the Ed Forum, things have posted, uh, various other forums where stuff's posted. Um, you know, there's so many resources out there to find documents and come across them. And, you know, when people ask for riff numbers about this and riff numbers about that, I don't give two shits about a riff number because I'll never be at NARA and I'll never be looking it up. And that's not how I search for documents on Mary Farrell. So just, just a little window when you, when you, when you're asking me for things, I am not going to have them. So don't bother asking. Cause by the time you hear this show, they'll already be inside of a huge metal dumpster. And, uh, then in the back of a big trash truck. And then, uh, buried in a landfill. So, and it, you know, as I read these documents, I try to tell you, you know, okay, the most pertinent stuff. This is an FBI document, folks, from eleven twenty three sixty three. Okay, and it's done by Bardwell Odom, who was an FBI agent, and it's a report from him. And it says at approximately 2 p.m. November 22nd, 1963, I was informed by an unidentified 
policeman of the Dallas Police Department that a suspect had been seen entering the back door of the Texas theater. Now, while this itself is not a crazy statement, um, he does have the timing off a little bit here, which makes you wonder what is going on here. I mean, he does say approximately 2 p.m., so... Okay. Because I believe Oswald was uh, arrested, you know, at about uh, quarter to two, 145, 140 to 145. And he says, I immediately proceeded to the Texas Theater at 231 West Jefferson and entered the front door and stood in the lobby to see that no one left the theater since there were no officers on guard there. A minute or two after arriving in the lobby, a Dallas County deputy sheriff ran by me from inside the theater stating, quote, they have him, unquote. And within a minute thereafter, I observed a young man with his hands cuffed behind him in the midst of a group of Dallas police officers being hustled out the front door of the theater. As he passed through the lobby, he shouted, police brutality. This man was white, about 22. 5'8", 160 pounds, brown hair, and was wearing a white shirt, dark trousers, and a reddish-brown jacket with the zipper open all the way in the front. From photographs observed later in the day, on November 22nd, I identify this individual as Lee Harvey Oswald. Okay. Now, again, on his face, this is not an innocuous document, other than the fact that the time is off, okay, for one. Uh, he didn't state where he was before when he um, was informed by an unidentified policeman that a suspect had been seen entering the back door. He then says, I proceeded to the Texas theater. So where was he before? Was he the tip of murder scene? Was he at uh, the Texas School Book Depository? I mean, where was he? How long, you know, approximately 2 p.m. he found this out. Then he had to get there. Then he had to see Oswald being taken out the front and all that jazz. And then he says that the man was wearing a reddish brown jacket with a zipper open all the way down the front. Well, Oswald's shirt wasn't a, wasn't a jacket for one. And it didn't have a zipper. It had buttons. So, you know, you would think a good trained FBI agent would have a would do a little bit better putting together a coherent uh, report. So, boo on you, Bardwell Odom. I just thought that was interesting. See, hear that? That's the sound of that document going in file 13, folks. Don't ask me where I got it. I have no clue. Not a clue. Next up, we have this fascinating document. It's a CIA internal memo from Thomas Karamessines. Yeah. Say that 20 times fast. This document was approved for release in 1992 via the CIA Historical Review Program. And this document, this internal memo, the CIA is from November 25th, 1963. Subject, Lee Harvey Oswald. Two, redacted. Oh, it makes little difference now, but redacted had at one time an operational interest in Oswald. As soon as I heard Oswald's name, I recalled that as chief of the 6th branch, I had discussed sometime in summer of 1960 uh, with the then chief and deputy chief of the 6th research section, the laying on of interviews through redacted or other suitable channels. At the moment, I don't recall if this was discussed while Oswald and his family were en route to our country or if it was after their arrival. So I believe... Uh, he is misremembering here, but sometime in summer 1962 instead of 60 sounds a little more plausible. 
since we're talking about Oswald returning to the United States. Two, I remember that Oswald's unusual behavior in the USSR had struck me from the moment I had read the first state dispatch on him, and I told my subordinates something amounting to, don't push too hard to get the information we need because this individual looks odd. We were particularly interested in the operational interests Oswald might provide on the mints factory in which he had been employed on certain sections of the city itself. And of course we saw the usual um, something intelligence that might help develop target personality dossiers. I was phasing into my redacted assignment, redacted at the time. Thus, I would have left our country shortly after Oswald's arrival. I do not know what action developed thereafter concerning Oswald. Addendum. As an afterthought, I recall also at the time I was becoming increasingly interested in watching develop a pattern that we had discovered in the course of our bio and research work in six. The number of Soviet women marrying foreigners being permitted to leave the USSR, then eventually divorcing their spouses and settling down abroad without returning home. The redacted case was among the first of these, and we eventually turned up something like two dozen similar cases. We established links between some of these women and the KGB. Redacted became interested in the developing trend we had come across. It was partly out of curiosity to learn if Oswald's wife would actually accompany him to our country, partly out of interest in Oswald's own experience in the USSR, that we showed operational intelligence interest in the Harvey story. TBC, that's Thomas Karamessin. Karamessin, yeah. Yeah, that last name. So, that's a pretty... That's a pretty important document there. It says a lot of things that uh, we've kind of established over the years that they probably would have done back then, such as debrief Oswald when he got back concerning uh, certain information. It says he'd been behind the Iron Curtain for three years. You would think that the uh, State Department or the CIA would want to know what he saw. But then also, they were hyper aware of these KGB trained honeypot spies who would marry foreigners and then return to their homelands with them and stay with them for a little while. When they were done, they would divorce. And uh, instead of going back home, the women would settle in a different foreign country. Um, so interesting stuff there for sure. Sure. And I always hear from people, you know, hey, Rob, Rob, uh, you know, can you can you point us towards something that that kind of shows that Oswald was up to something funky, you know? Well, aside from the glaringly obvious stuff out there, you know, like uh, handing out pro Castro literature and then one day and then offering to help the anti Castro Cubans another, um, you know, if you just do a little digging, folks, you will see things like what I'm about to tell you here. And what I'm about to tell you here is very, very interesting. And it's very telling. So, on his way back from Russia, uh, him and Marita had a nice uh, nine-day boat ride back from uh, Amsterdam to the United States. And while on this boat... Oswald had a lot of time to pretty much do anything he wanted. Marina said he spent a lot of time in the ship's library reading and writing. Now, many people believe that Oswald's, quote, historic diary or <laughs> Oswald's uh, debriefing document, if you will, was written not contemporaneously with his stay in Russia, but actually written in one foul swoop while on the ship on the way back, um, which is a whole nother story. But, you know, Oswald was a pretty smart guy. He figured that when he got back to 
America that there was going to be uh, either a lot of trouble considering his actions or a lot of fanfare and hubbub and bustle and reporters that wanted to ask him questions. So while on the boat, our buddy, Mr. Lee Harvey Oswald, decided to write down some questions that he was probably going to get asked by the, by the press upon his return, um, along with the answers to these questions. Okay? So they ask him, or he asked himself, whatever you want to say. Um, so, first, number one, why did you go to the USSR? Answer, I went as a citizen of the United States, as a tourist, residing in a foreign country, which I have a perfect right to do. I went there to see the land, the people, and how the system works. Question, what about those letters? Answer, I made no letters deriding the U.S. in any way. In correspondence with the U.S. Embassy, I made no anti-American statements or leveled any criticism I might have had uh, was of policies and not our government. Question, did you make statements against the U.S. there? Answer, no. What about that type recording? <laughs> I made a recording for radio, the Moscow Tourist Radio Travel Log, in which I spoke about sightseeing and what I had seen in Moscow tourist circles. I expressed delight in all the interesting places. I mentioned in this respect the university, the Museum of Art, Red Square, the Kremlin. I remember I closed this two-minute recording by saying I hoped our peoples would live in peace and FR, whatever the hell that means. Three, did you break laws by residing or taking work in the USSR? Under U.S. law, a person may lose the protection of the U.S. by voting or serving in the armed forces of a foreign state or taking an oath of allegiance to that state, and I did none of these actions. Number four, isn't all work in the USSR considered state work? Answer, no. Technically, only plants working directly for the state, usually defense, all other plants are owned by the workers who work, who work in them. Five, what about statements you make to UPI agent Miss Mosby in 1959? Answer, I was approached just after I had formally notified the U.S. Embassy in Moscow of my future residence in the USSR by the newspaper agencies in Moscow, including UPI, API, and Time, who were notified by the embassy. I did not call them. I answered questions and gave statements to Miss Mosby of UPI. I requested her to let me, okay, she sent her story before she released it, which is the polite and usual thing to do. Her version of what I said just after I, she sent it. I saw her version of what I said just after she sent it. I immediately called her to complain about this, at which time she apologized, but said her editor and not her had added several things. She said London was very excited about the story. That there, there is how I deduced that she had already sent it. So there wasn't much else I could do about it. I didn't realize that the story was even more blown out of shape once I got to the USA. I'm afraid the printed story was fabricated uh, and sensationalized. Number six, why did you remain in the USR, USSR for so long if you only wanted a look? I resided in the USSR until February when I wrote the embassy stating that I would like to go back. My passport was at the embassy for safekeeping. They invited me to Moscow for this purpose. However, it took me almost a half a year to get a permit to leave the city of Minsk for Moscow. In this connection, I had to use a letter from the head consular 
to the Russian authorities in Minsk. The Russians are very bureaucratic and slow about letting foreigners travel about the country, hence the visa. When I did get to Moscow, the embassy immediately gave me back my passport and advised me as to how to get an exit visa from the Russians for myself and my family. This long and arduous process took months from July 62 until blankety blank 62. Therefore, you see, almost one year was spent in trying to leave the country. That's why I was there so long, not out of desire. Are you a communist, and have you ever been a communist? Answer. No, of course not. I have never even known a communist outside of the ones in the, in, in the USSR, but you can't help that. Number eight. What are the outstanding differences between the USSA and the USSR? Freedom of speech. Travel, outspoken opposition to unpopular policies, freedom to believe in God, and newspapers. Thank you, sir. You are a real patriot. <laughs> this is the kind of shit that, that the guy is writing on the boat in anticipation of the flock of reporters that are going to be waiting for him, you know, to, to glean his story. But that document's not the end of the story. Because <laughs> there's also another version of the exact same scenario that Oswald wrote. You see, what I just read you was a very pro American uh, response that Oswald patriotically would have given. Um, had he been seen as just a simple tourist instead of a defector who surrendered his passport and his, and denounced his country and chose to live over there and work over there until he decided he wanted to come back. This version is the pro Russian pro communist, pro-Marxist, whatever you want to call it, version of his imaginary press conference. The questions again, why did you go to the USSR? I went as a mark of disgust, or I'm sorry, I went as a mark of disgust and protest against American political policies in foreign countries. My personal sign of discontent and horror at the misguided line of reasoning of the U.S. government and people. Question, what about those letters? I made several letters in which I expressed my above feeling to the American embassy when in October 59, I went there to legally li liquidate my American citizenship and was refused this legal right. Question two. Do you make statements against the U.S. there? Did you make statements against the U.S. while there? Yes. His first answer and the other document was no. Now it's yes. Okay. What about the tape recording? And he says, I made a recording for Radio Moscow, which was broadcast the following Sunday, in which I spoke about the beautiful capital of the socialist work and all of its progress. Three. Did you break laws by residing or taking work in the USSR? He says, I did, and then I took an oath of allegiance to the USSR. Now, the first document, he says he didn't do that. This one, he says, I took an oath to the allegiance of the USSR. Number four, isn't all work in the USSR considered state work? Yes, of course. And in that respect, I also broke U.S. law in accepting work under a foreign state. So his first answer was, no, of course not. There's a difference. What about statements you made to the UPI against Ms. Mosby? He said, I was approached by Ms. Mosby and other reporters just after I had formally requested the American embassy to legally liquidate my U.S. citizenship for a story. They were notified by the U.S. embassy, not by me. 
I answered questions and made statements to Miss Mosby in regard to my reasons for coming to the USSR. Her story was warped by her later, but in barest essence, it is possible to say she had the truth printed. Number six, why did you remain in the USSR for so long if you only wanted to look? Answer, I resided in the USSR for two and a half years. I did so because I was living quite comfortably. I had plenty of money, an apartment rent-free, lots of girls, etc. Why should I leave all that? Well, damn, he uh, allegedly married Marina right after he got there, right? So I guess he was plowing through some other women while he was there. Seven, are you a communist? Yes, basically. Although I hate the USSR and socialist system, I still think Marxism can work under different circumstances. Have you ever known a communist? Not in the USA, he says. Eight. What are the outstanding or what are the outstanding difference between the USSR and the USA? Answer. None, except in the U.S., the living standard is a little higher. Freedoms are about the same. <laughs> Medical aid and the educational system in the USSR is better than the USA. Okay. So there you have it, folks. Two very starkly, drastically different documents. Written by Oswald on his way back. I guess he was preparing himself for both sides of questionings concerning about how they may have wanted him to answer. You see, nobody does that. Nobody sits down and thinks about how they're going to answer questions either pro American or pro-Russian. I mean, you would think that returning to the United States, you, it was, it's going to be a pro-American slant, you know, because you're coming back to the United States. You want to be welcomed back with open arms, so, you know, you don't want to talk a bunch of shit about the United States and how much better Russia is than the United States. Now, if he was directed by someone else, to be that evil <laughs> Russian defector who still claims uh, to be a communist, Marxist, whatever, and uh, think that they're better than the United States, then one would maybe write things out to see how they're going to answer certain questions that may be asked to them. It's just very odd behavior. For someone who has no uh, intelligence background. And don't forget about his little Freudian slip in New Orleans when he was being interviewed. When he says that he was under the protection of the U.S. government while living in Russia. And, he said, and then he corrected himself very quickly, but... You know, sometimes things slip out through the cracks and, you know, the, the truth pokes its head out every once in a while. So very interesting set of documents there. Very eye-opening um, for those who are paying attention, folks. Pay attention. And what I just read you was in the 26 volumes. So, so if you want to find it, good luck. Head over there. Next up, we have a Secret Service interview of Erlene Roberts, handwritten statement by Erlene Roberts. Okay. And this was done, let's see here, on uh, no, December 5th, in front of a U.S. Secret Service agent, special agent, William Carter and Arthur Blake. Okay. It was obviously written out by one of them. It looks like uh, 
William Carter wrote it. Erlene Roberts looks to have signed it. Her signature looks like a second grade cursive special. Um, with probably meant, matched her mentality. But uh, a few things to glean from this. She goes over the usual. I live at 1026 Beckley, Dallas, Texas, and I serve as a housekeeper for a rooming house owned by Mr. and Mrs. A.C. Johnson. And on Friday, November 22nd, at approximately 1 p.m., I was sitting in the living room watching television about the president's assassination when a man I know is O.H. Lee, but who has since been identified as Lee Harvey Oswald, came into the front door and went to his room. Oswald did not have a jacket when he came in the house, and I don't recall what type of clothing he was wearing. Oswald went to his room and was only there for a few minutes before coming back out. I noticed he had a jacket he was putting on. I recall the jacket was a dark color. Dark color. So all this horse shit about them finding that gray or white jacket stuffed under a car after fleeing the tip and murder scene is nonsense. That's not Oswald's jacket, folks. Yeah. I recall the jacket was a dark color and it was the type that zips up the front. He was zipping the jacket up as he left. Um, I'm assuming part of this got cut off, but it says, On the curb... Blah, blah, blah. And on the same side of the street as our house. I just glanced out the window that once. I don't know how long Lee Oswald stood at that curb, nor did I see which direction he went when he left there. About 30 minutes later. Okay. So we have Oswald coming in the house at approximately one o'clock and leaving a couple minutes later and then standing out front for a couple minutes. Okay. So. About 30 minutes later, which would be about, would be nice and say, you know, 140, 145, three Dallas cops came to the house looking for Lee Harvey Oswald. We didn't know who Lee Harvey Oswald was until sometime later, his picture was flashed on television. I then let the Dallas policeman in the room occupied by Lee Oswald. While the Dallas police were searching the room, two FBI agents show up at the door. The police and the FBI agents took everything in the room that belonged to Lee Oswald. It also took our pillowcase and two towels and washcloths. Agents William Carter and Arthur Blake of the U.S. Secret Service, I have read this statement over and I find it to be true to the best of my knowledge, Erlene Roberts. So, three Dallas police show up at about 1.40. Oswald's not even arrested at the Texas Theater yet. What in the hell are these guys doing at his rooming house? When they have no idea who he is, allegedly. And then while the Dallas police are there, grabbing all this stuff out of his room, two FBI agents show up. How do they know? How do they know where Oswald lives? This wasn't established until much later, folks. And when I say much later, I mean by like three or four o'clock. So, again, how were the police and FBI at Oswald's rooming house so early. I mean, I could understand if there was, you know, a more of a smaller time gap here, but we're talking about, you know, a two hour discrepancy. And I don't think Erlene Roberts would have screwed up her timing of things by that much. So, interesting. How did they know? How did they know? And that again goes back to a previous episode we just did. How did they know? How did they know? I don't know. 
but it definitely, it definitely begs the question. All right, next up, switching gears here. An FBI document from December the 4th, 1963. Concerning Edwin Walker, retired Major General, information concerning. By letter dated 12-263, the Dallas office submitted a rifle bullet obtained from Lieutenant Carl Day of the Dallas Police Department. This bullet was recovered from the home of Edwin A. Walker, retired Major General, U.S. Army, on April 10, 1963, by the Dallas Police Department following the report of a bullet having been fired into Walker's home through a window. Investigation in connection with the assassination of President Kennedy discloses that the rifle used in the assassination was shipped to Lee Harvey Oswald in Dallas, Texas on March 20, 1963, and that Oswald continued to reside in Dallas until 4-29-63. It is requested that the lab compare the bullet from Walker's home with the test bullets obtained from Oswald's rifle. It was determined that the Walker bullet has the same physical characteristics as the assassination bullet in fragments. It is a 6.5 millimeter caliber bullet which has been fired from a four-land and groove right twist barrel. Man liquor Carcano rifles of the type used in the assassination are among those weapons which produce rifling characteristics such as are on the Walker bullet. It is noted that this bullet is extremely distorted and mutilated. Also, that it reportedly was fired on April 10, 63, some seven months ago. No test bullets known to have been fired from the subject gun near April 10, 63, are available. The only known test bullets from the assassination weapon are those recently fired in the FBI lab for comparison with the bullet and fragments involved in the assassination. Accordingly, because of the extreme mutilation and distortion of the bullet, and because the individual characteristics produced by the gun barrel may have changed during the intervening seven-month period, it could not be determined whether or not the Walker bullet was actually fired from Oswald's rifle. The results of the lab examination as set out above were arrived at were arrived at independently by three of our top firearms examiners in the lab. If test bullets known to have been fired near the date of April 63 are subsequently located, it may be possible to further resolve this question. Efforts are being made to see if similar earlier known bullets can be located. So there you go, folks. It could not be determined whether or not the Walker bullet was actually fired from Oswald's rifle. And that is from December of 63. So go F yourself. Now, from July 77, from a memo dated, or a memo dated 726-77 titled Walker Bullet. Now, this is during the HSCA investigation. They briefly address questions as to the recovered bullets inconsistently with Oswald's alleged weapon. It went on to cite Warren Commission testimony by the Fords to the effect that Marina had been coached by her attorney, William McKenzie, to testify that Oswald had only used one gun in the attempt on Walker. I believe it should be a simple matter to determine whether the recovered bullet matches Oswald's rifle and expect those tests to have been done by now. The following may be of use to you in the way of pursuing previously undeveloped leads. Hopefully these will be already old business to you also. So he says, while visiting Dallas last January, I contacted Ira Van Cleve at the Crimes Against Persons Division of the Dallas Police Department. Officer Van Cleve now operates a polygraph and security consulting firm separate from his official duties. At the time of the attempt on Major Walker's uh, life, Van Cleve was assigned to the investigation and quoted in the press to the effect that the recovered bullet had been fired from a 30 6 I asked him about this, and he stated the bullet had been too mangled for identification, and he had been mistaken. Hmm. 
Officer Van Cleve did go on that there was a reliable witness to the Walker shooting. Quote, a young neighbor boy saw two men in a car across an alleyway. Not far. He had a good view. This was apparently a reference to Walter Coleman, who Major Walker alleged in his Warren Commission testimony had been ordered by law enforcement not to talk. Possibly relevant to this matter, but certainly one of those outstanding questions not satisfactorily dealt with by the Warren Commission is the rifle Robert Adrian Taylor reported he received in a trade from a man resembling Oswald. Taylor described the rifle as a Springfield Bolt Action 30-06 bearing the markings U.S. Rock Island Arsenal Model 1903 and bearing serial number 66091. And this is from Commission Exhibit 2977. If there's any instance in which I can help you out regarding the above, I'd be honored to help. You can reach me by mail or by telephone. It's my pleasure to work with you during my employment there, Cliff. My best wishes for much success in the investigation. Sincerely, Kevin Walsh. And this is, of course, from Kevin Walsh to HSCA investigator Cliff Fenton. Now, regarding this bullet a little bit more. This is a letter from Edwin Walker to the U.S. Attorney General at the Department of Justice on February 12, 1979. The Dallas Police Department will verify that the bullet fired at Walker at 9 p.m. on April 10, 63, passed through the center wood cross strip of the outer screen, through the wood frames of both panes of the upper of the upper and lower window to include the copper weather strip between and through an inside masonry wall reinforced with solid tin and metal lathing, vintage 1926 to fall spent below the exit hole in the mortar blown from the wall. The bullet used and pictured on the TV by the U.S. Senate uh, G. Robert Blakey Committee on Assassinations is a ridiculous substitute for a bullet completely mutilated by such obstruction, bearing no resemblance to any unfired bullet in shape or form. I saw the hunk of lead picked up by a policeman in my house. And I took it from him, and I looked at it carefully. There is no mistake. There has been a substitution at some point for the bullet fired by Oswald and taken out of my house. It is requested that you withdraw the substituted bullet from all records and files pertaining to the assassination of John F. Kennedy and the attempted assassination of General Walker, and that you assure the security of the withdrawn bullet for future comparisons. I desire to be informed of your actions. Sincerely. Edwin A. Walker. This is a memo to the director of the FBI, June 21st, 1979, from Robert Cooch, who was special counsel for the attorney general. That means that's the lawyer. He says, I have received the, the attached letter from the legal counsel for former General Walker concerning allegations that the bullet fragments examined by the select committee, which were reportedly fragments of the bullet fired at Walker, could not, in fact, be such fragments. I would appreciate any information which could be provided that would enable me to provide a response to General Walker's lawyer. Thank you. Robert L. Hooch, Special Counsel to the Attorney General. So you see, folks, There was apparently some fookery going on. Now, General Walker always believed that Oswald had been the one that shot at him. And it's very easy to see uh, the HSCA bullet that was attributed as to being fired from Oswald's gun was, in fact, not the same bullet retrieved from his house. And this is according to General Walker himself. So if he wanted to lay everything at the feet of Oswald, all he had to do was go along with the official government story, the official government narrative, and the official government evidence. But even though he believed that Oswald was the one that shot at him, he is pulling them out on their bullet evidence, saying this is not the same bullet. This needs to be withdrawn from evidence. Rantings of a crazy man? Or what was going on here? continues the framing of Lee Harvey Oswald. 
All right, shifting gears again. Next up, this is a good one. From the County of Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. November 26, 1963. From DJ Caddy, a lieutenant at the Norwalk Station Burglary Detective Division. Subject, Lee Oswald, Dallas, Texas. Received confidential information from Sergeant J.L. Cooner, Norwalk Detectives, who states as follows. An informant, Tom Genkos, a bartender at the Hunt Room, states that on Saturday evening, November 23, 1963, that a patron in the Hunt Room, a bar located at 14433 East Telegraph Road in Whittier, California, stated that Mr. Ken Thornley was in the above indicated bar Friday night on November 22nd. Mr. Thornley stated that his son was well acquainted with Oswald. This acquaintance is a result from Mr. Thornley's son and Oswald having both served in the Marine Corps at the same time in California. They have become friends, and since their discharge, they have corresponded regularly. Mr. Thornley continued to relate that his son had numerous letters from Oswald, some of which are of a very recent dating. No information obtainable or volunteered as to what period the recent dates may be. In conclusion, Mr. Thornley stated that it is his understanding from his son that Oswald is in the process of writing a book. Sergeant Cooner states that Mr. Thornley lives in the immediate area and that a Ken Thornley is listed in the Northeast section phone book as residing at 15608 East Starbuck, Whittier, phone number OW75571. There is a business card attached to the original report listing Mr. Ken Thornley as being connected with the Ideal Engraving Company locating at 8828 Lakewood Boulevard in Downey, California. The bartender, Mr. Ginkos, did not pursue the matter further in an attempt to learn the name of the son of Ken Thornley. Well, Detective Caddy, his name was Kerry, with a K, kind of like Ken. Now this is some crazy information, folks. There's a lot of stuff in here, okay? So you have Kerry Thornley's dad getting drunk in a bar on November 22nd, 1963, and spouting his mouth off that his son and Oswald are very good friends that they write letters back and forth frequently and recently, and that Oswald is in the process of writing a book. Where is that in the evidence, folks? Where is that in the evidence? Huh. Interesting. Very, very interesting. Don't know where I got that one either. But I got it. All right, next up. This is a County of Dallas Sheriff's Department Supplementary Investigation Report from February 17, 1964, concerning property taken from a 1960 Olds 88 Oregon license 2Q7887. Now, the backstory, I'm guessing, on this vehicle was apparently found in the parking lot behind the grassy knoll. And this vehicle held the following. $3.12 in change, three $1 bills, an Atlas office printing outfit made into rubber stamp as follows. Help stamp out the kikes, the Negroid (laughs) Semitics want to integrate their Negro cousins, reactionary number one. Sixteen of the above described signs stamp out the kikes. Car papers on the above 60 olds. One letter addressed to Jane Murphy of Albuquerque, New Mexico. 
one box of Trojan rubbers, which I didn't know they had back in the early 60s, but apparently, apparently they did. One Corvair pen, transistor radio, several notes and letters addressed to complainant, assortment of newspapers, one Salt Lake Tribune, one white shirt, one blue tie, one brown suit, a century, uh, J.C. Penney's, one pack of Salem's, one extra set car keys for the above olds, one Mechanics Illustrated magazine, September 63, one Family Weekly magazine, one Winchester Rifle Advertisement magazine, one Rumble map. Decker, Mel, and McCurley, Jack Ravel, H.H. H. Davis Jr., D.A.'s office. Wild stuff there. Wonder whose car this was. Interesting. Very interesting, folks. Next up, we have a letter from Mary Farrell to Ann and Betsy, whoever the hell they are. Dated November the 4th, 1977. A lot of small talk. Boppity beepity boppity boo. Okay. Um, it says in September of 63, Richard Case Nagel was arrested in El Paso, Texas for firing a gun in a bank there. His papers and documents were taken by the FBI. And in about 69, 70, or 71, Bud Finsterwald was representing Nigel in an attempt to recover his possessions taken by the FBI. When Bud finally got them released, he Xeroxed them and sent the originals on to Nigel. A couple of years ago, a young man, now an old man, named Dick Russell, was in Bud's office going through the Nigel files. Dick called me and asked me if I'd ever seen a card bearing a picture and Oswald's signature numbered N4 blankety blank. I told Dick that that was the number of the, on the Uniform Services Identification and Privilege card that was issued to Oswald on September the 11th, 1959. The picture on the Oswald card in Nagel's possession in November or in September of 63. A Xerox of it found in Bud's file was not any picture we have ever seen before. Even though it's a rather poor Xerox, we could tell that it was not any picture of Oswald that anybody had ever seen before. I am not certain that it was a picture of Oswald at all. But the important question is, how did Nigel get a copy of that card and how did he have it in his possession two months prior to the assassination? Dick Russell made a Xerox of Bud Xerox, and of course, it is a terrible copy. Bud claims he has been unable to find his Xerox copy. Dick Russell later told me that the card was not in with other documents seized by the FBI from Nigel, but was in the pleadings file. Prior to getting this information from Dick Russell, I had put Richard Case Nigel in the same category as Ronald Augustinovich, Don Morgan, and others of the like. This was the first tangible link between Nigel and Oswald that I had actually seen with my own two eyes. If the card had actually been among the things the FBI seized in El Paso of September of 63, this is a bombshell. Um, da -da -da -da. Then in January 77, when I received another release from the CIA, with the name deleted but the date and place of birth indicated, they were Nigel's birth date and place of birth, and realized they were withholding completely three other documents about the same person, and two other documents being withheld or possibly about Nigel. This made Nigel gain importance in my mind. You might give the above to someone who is at least mildly interested in Nigel. I am enclosing a Xerox of the picture I believe was on the Oswald's Uniform Services Identification Card along with the Xerox of Gary Powers' card from the book about the trial. So, yeah, interesting. Very, very interesting. Yeah. All right. What does it mean? I don't know. But I had heard that before about uh, 
and Oswald identification card being found in with uh, Miguel's stuff that was in his trunk of funk uh, when he shot up the bank. So very interesting. All right. Next up, we have a handwritten statement written out by Richard Randolph Parr himself in the presence of Paul L. Scott, special agent of the FBI, on February the 3rd, 64, where it says, I, Richard Randolph Carr, make the following voluntary statement to Paul Scott, who has identified himself to me as a special agent of the FBI. I understand the statement is being furnished in connection with an official investigation being conducted by the FBI. So it goes on, you know, I was a steel worker and, you know, the whole Richard Randolph Carr story is that he was, he figured he was trying to get a job in Dallas and then he had dropped his wife off at Parkland and um, he continued down into Dealey Plaza and was climbing up a new scaffolded construction building going on there in Dealey Plaza looking for a job. And it just so happened that the assassination unfolded six floors below him um, and that he witnessed a uh, great many things, allegedly, from his vantage point. So he says, as I reached a point at approximately the sixth floor of the building framework, I looked toward the school book depository building located at the corner of Houston and Elm. And at that time, uh, I observed a man looking out of a window on the top floor of the school book depository. This man, a heavy set individual who was wearing a hat, a tan sport coat, and horn rimmed glasses, was not in the end window next to Houston Street, but was, I believe, in the second window over from Houston Street. I continued on up the stairway, and a minute or so later, I heard a noise which I took to be backfire of an automobile or a firecracker. Where we heard that before. Here was, there or there was a slight pause after the first report, and then two reports in very quick su succession. Where we heard that before. From where I was standing on the framework of the new courthouse building, I looked toward the triple underpass. It seemed to me that the noises I heard had come from that direction. As I looked, I saw several individuals falling to the ground. I do not recall that I looked toward the school book depository building after hearing the three reports. I immediately proceeded down the stairway of the building with the intention of going over to the triple underpass to see what had happened. When I reached the ground, I walked to Houston Street and down Houston Street to the Commerce Street intersection. I did not walk over to the site where I had previously seen people falling due to the large crowd which was already there. When I was on Houston Street near the Commerce Street intersection, I saw a man who I believe was identical with the man I had earlier seen in the building of the window at the school book depository. This man, walking very fast, proceeded on Houston Street south to Commerce Street, then east on Commerce Street to Record Street, which is one block over from there, and got into a 61 or 62 light gray Rambler station wagon which was parked just north of Commerce on Record Street. The station wagon, which had Texas license plates and was driven by a young Negro man, drove off in a northerly direction. I proceeded to my car, which was parked near the new county courthouse building, and drove by the residence of my brother and then to Pete Cates and All States Trailer Park, Zangs Boulevard, and Clarendon Street, Blah, 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 blah. I wish to state at this point that 
I did not see anyone in the school book building with a gun. I did not see the assassination of Kennedy, and I did not at any time tell anyone that I had seen the assassination of President Kennedy. So, very interesting stuff. And it just goes on to something about going to his sister's house and what he did later in the day and blah, 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 blah. Um, but of course, of interest is the gray, uh, light gray Nash Rambler station wagon driven by a Negro. Where have we heard that before, folks? So there you have further confirmation. And that comes from Richard Randolph Carr's own hand. All right, last document of the day, folks, from May 18th, 1967. To Jim Garrison from Penn Jones regarding the investigation. He says, I was on a radio show in Dallas about four months ago. A couple of days after the show, a man by the name of Richard Carr contacted me by telephone and said he had just had to talk to me. I went to Mr. Carr's home and spent about three hours with him. On November 22, 1963, he was on a construction uh, elevator of the new Dallas County Courthouse, seven floors above the ground, from which location he had a good view of the assassination scene. He reported to me that he saw two white men run from behind the wooden fence, that location being the one which we claim some of the shots from which President, uh, which killed President Kennedy. Carr stated that the two men ran in a northeasterly direction behind the school book depository. And while they were out of sight, they were joined by a colored man. He called him a Negro. The colored man got in the driver's seat of a gray nam, rash, nash, well, shit. A gray Rambler station wagon. One white man got in the rear seat on the left-hand side and the car drove north on Houston, turning to the right on Pacific. The other man, a dark-complected white male, about 5'8", heavyset, wearing dark-rimmed glasses, a brown hat and brown coat, walked south on Houston Street and turned to the left up Main Street where he disappeared from view. Carr further stated that while the shots were being fired, he saw one bullet hit the ground behind the president's car. Mr. Carr not only is a rifle buff, having a beautiful rifle case with several rifles on the wall of his home, he was an enlisted man in the 5th Ranger Battalion during World War II, and he was wounded in combat three times. His occupation at this time is a steel barker, and he was on the courthouse side that day applying for a job. He has a wife and three children, and as I left his home, he begged me not to get him killed. I never have released his statement nor anyone to, to except to Mr. Garrison. Within two or three days after the assassination, the FBI visited him in his home. They were very brusque and insulting in their manner. And they told Mr. Carr, if he did not see Oswald shoot out the sixth floor window, then he better keep his goddamn mouth shut. <laughs> So there you have it, folks. If you didn't see it, keep your goddamn mouth shut. That's right. Keep it shut. Shut your trap. From Dallas, Texas, the flash apparently... All right, folks. That's it for this week. Episode 244 is in the bag. Follow along on TikTok, on Twitter, on Instagram, at the Lone Gummin 7, and on YouTube. Search for the Lone Gummin Podcast channel. Make sure to like and subscribe and share with all your friends, all your acquaintances, and uh, maybe even some people you meet on the street. Just to turn them on to and say, hey, you ever hear the Loom Going Podcast? Ben Jones approves. Thank you, folks. Until next time, America.
Yeah.